Hello friends and welcome to the continuation in this calm reading of Little Women. Tonight I shall read for you two chapters. First, chapter 19, Amy's Will. And then chapter 20, Confidential. And now, let us unwind and begin these chapters. Chapter 19, Amy's Will. While these things were happening at home, Amy was having hard times at Aunt March's. She felt her exile deeply, and for the first time in her life, realized how much she was beloved and petted at home. Aunt March never petted anyone. She did not approve of it, but she meant to be kind, for the well-behaved little girl pleased her very much and Aunt Marge had a soft place in her old heart for her nephew's children, though she didn't think it proper to confess it. She really did her best to make Amy happy, but, dear me, what mistakes she made. Some old people keep young at heart in spite of wrinkles and gray hairs, can sympathize with children's little cares and joys, make them feel at home, and can hide wise lessons on the pleasant place, giving and receiving friendship in the sweetest way. But Aunt March had not this gift, and she worried Amy very much with her rules and orders, her prim ways, and long, prosy talks, finding the child more docile and amiable than her sister, the old lady felt it her duty to try and counteract, as far as possible, the bad effects of home freedom and indulgence. So she took Amy by the hand, and taught her as she herself had been taught sixty years ago, a process which carried dismay to Amy's soul, and made her feel like a fly in the web of a very strict spider. She had to wash the cups every morning, and polish up the old-fashioned spoons, the fat silver teapot, and the glasses till they shone. Then she must dust the room, and what a trying job that was. Not a speck escaped Aunt March's eye, and all the furniture had claw legs, and much carving, which was never dusted to suit. Then Polly had to be fed the lap dock combed, and a dozen trips upstairs and down to get things or deliver orders, for the old lady was very lame and seldom left her big chair. After these tiresome labors, she must do her lessons, which was the daily trial of every virtue she possessed. Then she was allowed one hour for exercise or play, and didn't she enjoy it. Laurie came every day, and wheedled Aunt March till Amy was allowed to go out with him when they walked and rode and had capital times. After dinner she had to read aloud, and sit still while the old lady slept, which she usually did for an hour, as she dropped off over the first page. Then patchwork or towels appeared, and Amy sewed with outward meekness and inward rebellion till dusk, when she was allowed to amuse herself as she liked till tea-time. The evenings were the worst of all, for Aunt March fell to telling long stories about her youth, which were so unutterably dull that Amy was always ready to go to bed intending to cry over her hard fate, but usually going to sleep before she had squeezed out more than a tear or two. If it had not been for Laurie and old Esther, the maid, she felt that she never could have got through that dreadful time. The parrot alone was enough to drive her distracted, for he soon felt that she did not admire him 
and revenged himself by being as mischievous as possible. He pulled her hair whenever she came near him, upset his bread and milk to plague her, when she had newly cleaned his cage, made mop bark by pecking at him while Madame dozed, called her names before company, and behaved in all respects like a reprehensible old bird. Then she could not endure the dog, a fat cross beast, who snarled and yelped at her when she made his toilet, and who lay on his back with all his legs in the air, and a most idiotic expression of countenance when he wanted something to eat, which was about a dozen times a day. The cook was bad-tempered, the old coachman was deaf, and Esther the only one who ever took any notice of the young lady. Esther was a Frenchwoman, who had lived with Madame, as she called her mistress, for many years, and who rather tyrannized over the old lady, who could not get along without her. Her real name was Estelle, but Aunt Marge ordered her to change it, and she obeyed, on condition that she was never asked to change her religion. She took a fancy to Mademoiselle, and amused her very much with odd stories of her life in France, when Amy sat with her while she got up Madame's laces. She also allowed her to roam about the great house, and examine the curious and pretty things stored away in the little wardrobes and the ancient chests, for Aunt March hoarded like a magpie. Amy's chief delight was an Indian cabinet full of queer drawers, little pigeonholes and secret places in which were kept all sorts of ornaments, some precious, some merely curious, all more or less antique. To examine and arrange these things gave Amy great satisfaction especially the jewel cases, in which on velvet cushions reposed the ornaments which had adorned a bell forty years ago. And there was the garnet set which Aunt March wore when she came out, the pearls her father gave her on her wedding day, her lover's diamonds, the jet mourning rings and pins, the queer lockets, with portraits of dead friends and weeping willows made of hair inside. The baby bracelets her one little daughter had worn, Uncle March's big watch, with the red seal so many childish hands had played with. And in a box all by itself lay Aunt March's wedding ring, too small now for her fat finger. But put carefully away, like the most precious jewel of them all. Which would Mademoiselle choose if she had her will? asked Esther, who always sat near to watch over and lock up the valuables. I like the diamonds best, but there is no necklace among them, and I am fond of necklaces. They are so becoming. I should choose this if I might replied Amy, looking with great admiration at a string of gold and ebony beads, from which hung a heavy cross of the same. I too covet that, but not as a necklace, ah, no, to me it is a rosary, and as such I should use it like a good Catholic, said Esther, eyeing the handsome thing wistfully. Is it meant to use as you use the string of good-smelling wood beads hanging over your glass? asked Amy. Truly, yes, to pray with. It would be pleasing to the saints if one used so fine a rosary as this, instead of wearing it as a vain bijou. You seem to take a great deal of comfort in your prayers, Esther, and always come down looking quiet and satisfied. I wish I could. If Mademoiselle was a Catholic, she would find true comfort. But as that is not to be, it would be well if you went apart each day to meditate and pray, as did the good mistress whom I served before Madame. 
She had a little chapel, and in it found solace for much trouble. Would it be right for me to do so too? asked Amy, who in her loneliness felt the need of help of some sort, and found that she was apt to forget her little book, now that Beth was not there to remind her of it. It would be excellent and charming, and I shall gladly arrange the little dressing room for you if you like it. Say nothing to Madame, but when she sleeps, go you and sit alone a while to think good thoughts, and pray the dear God preserve your sister. Esther was truly pious, and quite sincere in her advice, for she had an affectionate heart, and felt much for the sisters in their anxiety. Amy liked the idea, and gave her leave to arrange the light closet next to her room, hoping it would do her good. I wish I knew where all these pretty things would go when Aunt March dies, she said, as she slowly replaced the shining rosary and shut the jewel cases one by one. To you and your sisters, I know it. Madame confides in me. I witnessed her will, and it is to be so, whispered Esther, smiling. How nice, but I wish she'd let us have them now. Procrastination is not agreeable, observed Amy, taking a last look at the diamonds. It is too soon yet for the young ladies to wear these things. The first one who is affianced will have the pearls. Madame has said it and I have a fancy that the little turquoise ring will be given to you when you go, for Madame approves your good behavior and charming manners. Do you think so? Oh, I'll be a lamb, if I can only have that lovely ring. It's ever so much prettier than Kitty Bryant's. I do like Aunt March after all. And Amy tried on the blue ring with a delighted face and a firm resolve to earn it. From that day she was a model of obedience, and the old lady complacently admired the success of her training. Esther fitted up the closet with a little table, placed the footstool before it, and over it a picture taken from one of the shut-up rooms. She thought it was of no great value, but... Being appropriate, she borrowed it, well knowing that Madame would never know it, nor care if she did. It was, however, a very valuable copy of one of the famous pictures of the world, and Amy's beauty-loving eyes were never tired of looking up at the sweet face of the Divine Mother, while her tender thoughts of her own were busy at her heart. On the table she laid her little testament and hymn book, kept a vase always full of the best flowers Lori brought her, and came every day to sit alone, thinking good thoughts, and praying the dear God to preserve her sister. Esther had given her a rosary of black beads with a silver cross, but Amy hung it up and did not use it feeling doubtful as to its fitness for Protestant prayers. The little girl was very sincere in all this, for, being left alone outside the safe home nest, she felt the need of some kind hand to hold by, so sorely that she instinctively turned to the strong and tender friend, whose fatherly love most closely surrounds his little children. She missed her mother's help to understand and rule herself, but having been taught where to look, she did her best to find the way and walk in it confidingly. But Amy was a young pilgrim, and just now her burden seemed very heavy. She tried to forget herself, to keep cheerful, and be satisfied with doing right, for no one saw or praised her for it. In her first effort at being very, very good, she decided to make her will, as Aunt March had done, so that if she did fall ill and die, her possessions might be justly and generously divided. 
It cost her a pang even to think of giving up the little treasures, which in her eyes were as precious as the old lady's jewels. During one of her play hours, she wrote out the important document as well as she could, with some help from Esther as to certain legal terms. And when the good-natured Frenchwoman had signed her name, Amy felt relieved and laid it by to show Laurie, whom she wanted as a second witness. As it was a rainy day, she went upstairs to amuse herself in one of the large chambers and took Polly with her for company. In this room there was a wardrobe full of old-fashioned costumes with which Esther allowed her to play, and it was a favorite amusement to array herself in the faded brocades, and parade up and down before the long mirror, making stately curtsies and sweeping her train about with a rustle which delighted her ears. So busy was she on this day that she did not hear Laurie's ring, nor see his face peeping in at her as she gravely promenaded to and fro, flirting her fan and tossing her head, on which she wore a great pink turban, and contrasting oddly with her blue brocade dress and yellow quilted petticoat. She was obliged to walk carefully, for she had on high-heeled shoes, and, as Laurie told Joe afterward, it was a comical sight to see her mince along in her gay suit, with Polly sliding and bridling just behind her, imitating her as well as he could, and occasionally stopping to laugh or exclaim, Ain't we fine? Get along, you fright! Hold your tongue! Kiss me, dear! Ha ha! Having with difficulty restrained an explosion of merriment, lest it should offend Her Majesty, Laurie tapped and was graciously received. Sit down and rest while I put these things away, and then I want to consult you about a very serious matter, said Amy, when she had shown her splendor and driven Polly into a corner. That bird is the trial of my life, she continued removing the pink mountain from her head, while Laurie seated himself astride the chair. Yesterday, when Aunt was asleep, and I was trying to be as still as a mouse, Polly began to squall and flap about in his cage. So I went to let him out, and found a big spider there. I poked it out, and it ran under the bookcase. Polly marched straight after it, stooped down and peeped under the bookcase, saying, in his funny way, with a cock of his eye, Come out and take a walk, my dear. I couldn't help laughing, which made Polly swear, and Aunt woke up and scolded us both. Did the spider accept the old fellow's invitation? asked Glory, yawning. Yes, out it came, and away ran Polly frightened to death, and scrambled up on Aunt's chair, calling out, Catch her! Catch her! Catch her! as I chased the spider. That's a lie! Oh, lore! cried the parrot, pecking at Laura's toes. I'd wring your neck if you were mine, you old torment, cried Laurie, shaking his fist at the bird who put his head on one side and gravely croaked. Ali liar, bless your buttons, dear. Now I am ready, said Amy, shutting the wardrobe and taking a piece of paper out of her pocket. I want you to read that, please, and tell me if it is legal and right. I felt I ought to do it, for life is uncertain, and I don't want any ill feeling over my tomb. Laurie bit his lips, and turning a little from the pensive speaker, read the following document, with praiseworthy gravity, considering the spelling. My Last Will and Testament I, Amy Curtis March, being in my sane mind, go give and bequeath all my earthly property, viz to wit, namely, to my father, 
my best pictures, sketches, maps and works of art, including frames. Also, my $100 to do what he likes with. To my mother, all my clothes, except a blue apron with pockets. Also, my likeness and my medal with much love. To my dear sister Margaret, I give my turquoise ring, if I get it. Also, my green box with the doves on it. Also, my piece of real lace for her neck. And my sketch of her as a memorial of a little girl. To Joe. I leave my breast pin, the one mended with sealing wax, also my bronze inkstand. She lost the cover and my most precious plaster rabbit, because I am sorry I burned up her story. To Beth, if she lives after me, I give my dolls and little bureau, my fan, my linen collars and my new slippers, if she can wear them being thin when she gets well. And I, herewith, also leave her my regret that I ever made fun of old Joanna. To my friend and neighbor, Theodore Lawrence, I bequeath my paper mache portfolio. My clay model of a horse, though he did say it hadn't any neck. Also in return for his great kindness in the hour of affliction, any one of my artistic works he likes. Notre Dame is the best. To our venerable benefactor, Mr. Lawrence, I leave my purple box with a looking-glass in the cover, which will be nice for his pens and remind him of the departed girl, who thanks him for his favors to her family, especially Beth. I wish my favorite playmate, Kitty Bryant, to have the blue silk apron and my gold bead ring with a kiss. To Hannah I give the bandbox she wanted and all the patchwork I leave, hoping she will remember me when it you see. And now, having disposed of my most valuable property, I hope all will be satisfied and not blame the dead. I forgive everyone and trust we may all meet when the trump shall sound. Amen. To this will and testament I set my hand and seal on this twentieth day of November, Anni Domino, 1861. Amy Curtis March. Witnesses, Estelle Valnor, Theodore Lawrence. The last name was written in pencil, and Amy explained that he was to rewrite it in ink and seal it up for her properly. What put it into your head? Did anyone tell you about Beth's giving away her things? Asked Lori soberly, as Amy laid a bit of red tape, with sealing wax, a taper, and a standish before him. She explained and then asked anxiously, What about Beth? I'm sorry I spoke, but as I did, I'll tell you. She felt so ill one day that she told Joe she wanted to give her piano to Meg, her cats to you, and the poor old doll to Joe, who would love it for her sake. She was sorry she had so little to give, and left locks of hair to the rest of us, and her best love to Grandpa. She never thought of a will. Laurie was signing and sealing as he spoke and did not look up till a great tear dropped on the paper. Amy's face was full of trouble, but she only said, Don't people put sort of postscripts to their wills sometimes? Yes, codicils, they call them. Put one in mind, then, that I wish all my curls cut off and given around to my friends. I forgot it, but I want it done, though it will spoil my looks. Glory added it, smiling at Amy's last and greatest sacrifice. Then he amused her for an hour, and was much interested in all her trials. But when he came to go, Amy held him back to whisper with trembling lips. Is there really any danger about Beth? 
I'm afraid there is. But we must hope for the best, so don't cry, dear. And Laurie put his arm about her with a brotherly gesture, which was very comforting. When he had gone, she went to her little chapel, and sitting in the twilight, prayed for Beth, with streaming tears and an aching heart, feeling that a million turquoise rings would not console her for the loss of her gentle little sister. Chapter 12 Confidential I don't think I have any words in which to tell the meeting of the mother and daughters. Such hours are beautiful to live, but very hard to describe. So I will leave it to the imagination of my readers, merely saying that the house was full of genuine happiness, and that Meg's tender hope was realized, for when Beth woke from that long, healing sleep, the first objects on which her eyes fell were the little rose and mother's face. Too weak to wonder at anything, she only smiled and nestled close in her loving arms about her, feeling that the hungry longing was satisfied at last. Then she slept again, and the girls waited upon their mother, for she would not unclasp the thin hand which clung onto hers even in sleep. Hannah had dished up an astonishing breakfast for the traveler finding it impossible to vent her excitement in any other way, and Meg and Joe fed their mother like dutiful young storks, while they listened to her whispered account of father's state. Mr. Brooks promised to stay and nurse him, the delays which the storm occasioned on the homeward journey, and the unspeakable comfort Laurie's hopeful face had given her when she arrived, worn out with fatigue, anxiety, and cold. What a strange yet pleasant day that was, so brilliant and gay without, for all the world seemed abroad to welcome the first snow, so quiet and reposeful within, for everyone slept, spent with watching, and the Sabbath stillness reigned throughout the house. While nodding Hannah mounted guard at the door, with a blissful sense of burdens lifted off, Meg and Joe closed their weary eyes and lay at rest, like storm-beaten boats safe at anchor in a quiet harbor. Mrs. March would not leave Beth's side, but rested in the big chair, waking often to look at, touch, and brood over her child, like a miser over some recovered treasure. Laurie, meanwhile, posted off to comfort Amy, and told his story so well that Aunt March actually sniffed herself, and never once said, I told you so. Amy came out so strong on this occasion that I think the good thoughts in the little chapel really began to bear fruit. She dried her tears quickly, restrained her impatience to see her mother, and never even thought of the turquoise ring, when the old lady heartily agreed in Laurie's opinion that she behaved like a capital little woman. Even Polly seemed impressed, for he called her a good girl, blessed her buttons, and begged her to come and take a walk, dear, in his most affable tone. She would very gladly have gone out to enjoy the bright wintry weather, but discovering that Laurie was dropping with sleep, in spite of manful efforts to conceal the fact, she persuaded him to rest on the sofa, while she wrote a note to her mother. She was a long time about it, and when she returned, he was stretched out with both arms under his head, sound asleep, while Aunt March had pulled down the curtains and sat doing nothing, in an unusual fit of benignity. After a while, they began to think he was not going to wake up till night, and I'm not sure that he would, had he not been effectually roused by Amy's cry of joy at sight of her mother. 
There probably were a good many happy little girls in and about the city that day, but it is my private opinion that Amy was the happiest of all. When she sat in her mother's lap and told her trials, receiving consolation and compensation in the shape of approving smiles and fond caresses. They were alone together in the chapel, to which her mother did not object when its purpose was explained to her. On the contrary, I like it very much, dear. Looking from the dusty rosary to the well-worn little book, and the lovely picture with its garland of evergreen. It is an excellent plan to have some place where we can go to be quiet, when things vex and grieve us. There are a good many hard times in this life of ours, but we can always bear them if we ask help in the right way. I think my little girl is learning this. Yes, mother, and when I go home I mean to have a corner in the big closet to put my books, and a copy of that picture which I've tried to make. The woman's face is not good. It's too beautiful for me to draw, but the baby is done better, and I love it very much. I like to think he was a little child once, for then I don't seem so far away, and that helps me. As Amy pointed to the smiling Christ child on his mother's knee, Mrs. March saw something on the lifted hand that made her smile. She said nothing, but Amy understood the look, and after a minute's pause she added gravely, I wanted to speak to you about this, but I forgot it. Aunt gave me the ring today. She called me to her and kissed me, and put it on my finger, and said I was a credit to her, and she'd like to keep me always. She gave that funny guard to keep the turquoise on, as it's too big. I'd like to wear them, mother. Can I? They are very pretty, but I think you're rather too young for such ornaments, Amy, said Mrs. March, looking at the plump little hand, with the band of sky-blue stones on the forefinger, and the quaint guard formed of two tiny golden hands clasped together. I'll try not to be vain, said Amy. I don't think I like it only because it's so pretty, but I want to wear it as the girl in the story wore her bracelet, to remind me of something. Do you mean Aunt March? asked her mother, laughing. No, to remind me not to be selfish. Amy looked so earnest and sincere about it that her mother stopped laughing and listened respectfully to the little plan. I've thought a great deal lately about my bundle of naughties, and being selfish is the largest one in it, so I'm going to try hard to cure it, if I can. Beth isn't selfish, and that's the reason everyone loves her, and feels so bad at the thoughts of losing her. People wouldn't feel so bad about me if I was sick, and I don't deserve to have them, but I'd like to be loved and missed by a great many friends so I'm going to try and be like Beth all I can. I'm apt to forget my resolutions, but if I had something always about me to remind me, I guess I should do better. Maybe try this way. Yes, but I have more faith in the corner of the big closet. Wear your ring, dear, and do your best. I think you will prosper, for the sincere wish to be good is half the battle. Now I must go back to Beth. Keep up your heart, little daughter, and we will soon have you home again. That evening, while Meg was writing to her father to report the traveler's safe arrival, Joe slipped upstairs into Beth's room, and finding her mother in her usual place, stood a minute, twisting her fingers in her hair, with a worried gesture and an undecided look. What is it, dearie? asked Mrs. March, holding out her hand, with a face which invited confidence. I want to tell you something, Mother. About Meg? How quickly you guessed. Yes, it's about her. And though it's a little thing, it fidgets me. 
and Beth is asleep. Speak low and tell me all about it. That Moffat hasn't been here, I hope, asked Mrs. Marge rather sharply. No, I should have shut the door in his face if he had, said Joe, settling herself on the floor at her mother's feet. Last summer Meg left a pair of gloves over at the Lawrence's, and only one was returned. We forgot about it till Teddy told me that Mr. Brooke owned that he liked Meg, but didn't dare to say so. She was so young, and he so poor. Now, isn't it a dreadful state of things? Do you think Meg cares for him? asked Mrs. Marge with an anxious look. Mercy me, I don't know anything about love and such nonsense, cried Joe, with a funny mixture of interest and content. In novels, the girls show it by starting and blushing, fainting away, growing thin and acting like fools. Now Meg does not do anything of the sort. She eats and drinks and sleeps like a sensible creature. She looks straight in my face when I talk about that man and only blushes a little bit when Teddy jokes about lovers. I forbid him to do it, but he doesn't mind me as he ought. Then you fancy that Meg is not interested in John. Who? cried Joe, staring. Mr. Brock, I call him John now. We fell into the way of doing so at the hospital, and he likes it. Oh, dear, I know you'll take his part. He's been good to father, and you won't send him away. But let Meg marry him if she wants to. Mean thing. To go petting papa and helping you. Just to wheedle you into liking him. And Joe pulled her hair again with a wrathful tweak. My dear, don't get angry about it, and I will tell you how it happened. John went with me at Mr. Lawrence's request and was so devoted to poor father that we couldn't help getting fond of him. He was perfectly open and honorable about Meg, for he told us he loved her, but would earn a comfortable home before he asked her to marry him. He only wanted our leave to love her and work for her, and a right to make her love him if he could. He is a truly excellent young man and we could not refuse to listen to him, but I will not consent to Meg's engaging herself so young. Of course not, it would be idiotic. I knew there was mischief brewing. I felt it, and now it's worse than I imagined. I just wish I could marry Meg myself, and keep her safe in the family. This odd arrangement made Mrs. March smile. But she said gravely, Joe, I confide in you and don't wish you to say anything to Meg yet. When John comes back and I see them together, I can judge better of her feelings toward him. She'll see those handsome eyes that she talks about and then it will be all up with her. She's got such a soft heart, it will melt like butter in the sun if anyone looks sentimentally at her. She read the short reports that he sent more than she did your letters, and pinched me when I spoke of it, and likes brown eyes, and doesn't think John an ugly name, and she'll go and fall in love, and there's an end of peace and fun, and cozy times together. I see it all. They'll go lovering around the house, and we shall have to dodge. Meg will be absorbed and no good to me any more. Brooke will scratch up a fortune somehow, carry her off, and make a hole in the family, and I shall break my heart, and everything will be abominably uncomfortable. Oh dear me, why weren't we all boys? Then there wouldn't be any bother. Jo leaned her chin on her knees in a disconsolate attitude and shook her fist at the reprehensible John. Mrs. March sighed, and Joe looked up with an air of relief. You don't like it, mother. I'm glad of it. Let's send him about his business, and not tell Meg a word of it. 
but all be happy together as we always have been. I did wrong to side, Joe. It is natural and right you should all go to homes of your own in time. But I do want to keep my girls as long as I can, and I am sorry that this happened so soon, for Meg is only seventeen, and it will be some years before John can make a home for her. Your father and I have agreed that she shall not bind herself in any way, nor be married before twenty. If she and John love one another, they can wait, and test the love by doing so. She is conscientious, and I have no fear of her treating him unkindly. My pretty, tender-hearted girl, I hope things will go happily with her. Hadn't you rather have her marry a rich man? asked Jo, as her mother's voice faltered a little over the last words. Money is a good and useful thing, Jo, and I hope my girls will never feel the need of it too bitterly, nor be tempted by too much. I should like to know that John was firmly established in some good business which gave him an income large enough to keep free from debt and make Meg comfortable. I am not ambitious for a splendid fortune, a fashionable position, or a great name for my girls. If rank and money come with love and virtue also, I should accept them gratefully, and enjoy your good fortune, but I know, by experience, how much genuine happiness can be had in a plain little house, where the daily bread is earned, and some privations give sweetness to the few pleasures. I am content to see Meg begin humbly, for if I am not mistaken, she will be rich in the possessions of a good man's heart and that is better than a fortune. I understand, mother, and quite agree, but I'm disappointed about Meg, for I'd planned to have her marry Teddy by and by and sit in the lap of luxury all her days. Wouldn't it be nice? asked Jo, looking up with a brighter face. He is younger than she, you know, began Mrs. March, but Jo broke in. Only a little. He is old for his age, and tall, and can be quite grown up in his manners if he likes. Then he's rich and generous and good, and loves us all. And I say it's a pity my plan is spoiled. I am afraid Laurie has hardly grown up enough for Meg, and altogether too much of a weathercock just now for anyone to depend on but let time and their own hearts mate your friends. We can't meddle safely in such matters, and had better not get romantic rubbish, as you call it, into our heads, lest it spoil our friendship. Well, I won't, but I hate to see things going all crisscross and getting snarled up, when a pull here and a snip there would straighten it out. I wish wearing flat irons on our heads would keep us from growing up. But buds will be roses and kittens cats. More's the pity. What's that about flat irons and cats? asked Meg as she crept into the room with the finished letter in her hand. Only one of my stupid speeches. I am going to bed. Come, Peggy, said Joe unfolding herself like an animated puzzle. Quite right and beautifully written. Please add that I sent my love to John, said Mrs. Marge, as she glanced over the letter and gave it back. Do you call him John? asked Meg, smiling, with her innocent eyes looking down into her mother's. Yes, he has been like a son to us, and we are very fond of him replied Mrs. March, returning the look with a keen one. I'm glad of that. He is so lonely. Good night, mother dear. It is so inexpressibly comfortable to have you here, was Meg's answer. The kiss her mother gave her was a very tender one, and as she went away, Mrs. March said, with a mixture of satisfaction and regret, 
She does not love John yet, but will soon learn to.